Rossi spent his entire career thinking about the relationships between individual elements of architecture and architecture as a discipline, the very beginnings of architecture and the ends of architecture. And he spent his career exploring the relationship between architectural practice on the kind of everyday level and architecture as a theoretical intellectual project. He came to the conclusion that what he called the architectural type was the beginning and the end of architecture, but that the architectural type could never be exhausted either by architectural practice or by architectural theory. That the type, this unavailable but real object that both generated and uh, sort of became the reference for all of architecture um, was, was, was itself inaccessible and inexhaustible. When Rossi thought about type, he was considering architecture as it as it's manifest in history in various examples and sort of recurring patterns and recurring forms that emerge at different times in history but seem, but seem correlated. But he was also thinking about architecture in the city. For him, the architectural elements constitute the city. But at the same time, the city is this kind of determinate matrix or fabrics that bring the elements into being. In his book, Architecture of the City, he emphasizes the continuity of these urban types. He uses the word permanences to, uh, uh, to, to, to convey the sense of persistence of types uh, over time through various different kinds of uses. One of the examples he gives is the Roman Colosseum at Lucca, which first of all in medieval times was used as a kind of quarry. The stones from the Roman Colosseum were taken as spoils to construct medieval churches. And then it later became a market and then later housing. But as you can see in the photograph, the diagram or the type of the Colosseum remains over all those functional changes. This is an example of what Rossi calls a propelling permanence. The form remains, but it carries us through changes in history, changes in function, and even changes in the way that the Colosseum uh, is inhabited. In his own work, the idea of architectural type and its relationship to city can best be seen in his most famous project, which is a cemetery, the Cemetery of San Cataldo in Modena, for which he won the competition in 1971. The site for the cemetery is exactly adjacent to an existing 19th century cemetery by Cesare Costa. In between Rossi Cemetery and Costa Cemetery is a much smaller Jewish cemetery. And so the three cemeteries together make up this set. Rossi Cemetery is almost exactly the same size and shape as Costa's cemetery. It's about 325 by 175 meters. It's surrounded by a two-story wall, which later was changed to three stories. You can enter it at either the south gate or the north gate. Along this north-south axis, Rossi places three distinct architectural types. First of all, very like the monument at Cuneo, is a large cube, a large empty uh, Rossi even said abandoned cube. It doesn't have a roof. It's open to the sky. Rather than the strip windows or the narrow windows of Cuneo, it now has these punched repetitive square windows. There are no mullions, no frames to the windows. If we continue along the axis, we confront another feature, this triangular shaped in plan, but consists of vertical rectangular slabs that increase in height as they decrease in width. These would be the ossuaries, which would house the remains of the body, and we can walk through those ossuaries along the axis until we finally come to the third feature, which is a large truncated cone. The cone is higher than any of the other features. The cube was intended by Rossi to be used for funeral ceremonies, but also civil ceremonies. As I said, the slabs were intended for, as ossuaries. And then the top part of the cone is a chapel, but then in a room at the bottom part of the cone would be a place for the ashes, for the remains of the indigent. 
Now, this is an important feature. If we compare this to the cemetery of Costa, certain contrasts arise. In the cemetery of Costa, which is typical of 19th century Italian cemeteries, usually in the center would be a chapel. And this chapel would be where the remains of the upper class families would be buried. Along the porticos to the side of the chapel would be for other, perhaps not noble families, but other upper class families. And the indigent, who may not have been even known or who may not have had families, would be placed in the earth. But of course the earth, the graves of the earth filled up very, very quickly and, and it was uh, allowed that every eight years the, the, uh, the bones could be taken out uh, and put in a common grave. So, so Rossi in a way has reversed that hierarchy. The truncated cone, which is higher than any other feature, now houses the remains of the indigent and exactly along the axis, along that central axis, where previously the noble families and the upper class would have been buried. And I think that contrast is very intentional and, and very sharp. The walls around the cemetery are very, very stark. Again, they have openings without muntins or mullions or window frames. It reminds you of some of the German architect Ludwig Hilbersheimer's work, except that Rossi places a kind of sharply, steeply pitched triangular roof on top of these otherwise austere walls. Rossi talks about the tops of Etruscan funerary urns, which have a similar triangular shape. So he's getting multiple references, references to Etruscan urns, references to modern, uh, to modern architecture, uh, but also he's making references to his own work. Rossi compared the walls to his own housing project called the Gallaratesi, just outside Milan. And he makes the point that in very, very early times, uh, the grave was just thought of as, as, as a kind of house for the dead, or the tomb was thought of as a room for the dead. So for him, he, he, this contrast between the housing of living bodies, the housing of dead remains, is part of what he means when he thinks of the cemetery as an analogous city. The graves are analogs of houses, houses for the dead. The monuments are analogs of the permanent monuments that would take place in a city, though in a city there would be inhabited monuments. So the cemetery is a city of the dead, but it's also what Rossi calls an analogous city. In this aerial perspective, which Rossi uses to show both the elevational perspective of the building and also at the same time its plan, you can see that that triangular feature in the middle almost takes on the characteristics of a stepped pyramid. It seems to be rising up from the grounds. And I think this reference somehow is, there are other references that are to architecture in its most primitive state. I even think of Hegel and who thought of the pyramid as the very beginning of architecture. And I can't imagine that this reference to Hegel is, uh, and to the beginnings of architecture uh, uh, is lost on Rossi. Look at the way Rossi cast the shadows. It's very interesting that he casts the shadows toward the viewer. I think what he's thinking of here is something that he referred to in his own essay on the French architect Etienne Boulay. He's thinking about Boulay's own funerary architecture and he says, it does not seem possible to me to conceive anything sadder than a monument composed of a smooth, naked, and unadorned surface of a light absorbent material absolutely bare of details, and of which the decoration is formed by a composition of shadows drawn by shadows still darker. Look again at Rossi's drawing, how dark the shadows are. It's as if the shadows are the only inhabitants of the city.